It's a great segue into our next talk by Dr. Worf. Um, most everybody who's probably logged on knows Dr. Benjamin Worf. Um, he's been a pioneer in the field of neuroendoscopy and pediatrics for the last uh, probably what, 18 years now, um, as he uh, developed um, a, a system and a practice of using a flexible neuroendoscope in a developing country, uh, mostly because the need was there. And uh, he brought that back with him to the United States and has been pivotal in showing us what we can accomplish with neuroendoscopy and pediatrics. So it's both of our great pleasures to in introduce you, Dr. Worf. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, thanks very much. I, I, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, greetings from, uh, from Boston. Um, and, and I'd like to start out by saying, by actually thanking uh, Mark for an absolutely magisterial uh, lecture on endoscopic third ventriculostomy. I, it, it was spectacular. And anybody who wants to learn about that procedure could, should watch his uh, presentation uh, over and over again, because there's a lot uh, to learn there. And I uh, agree with everything he, he said. Um, my uh, talk will be more towards introducing uh, the audience to the concept of adding choroid plexus cauterization to ETV, why we do that, how well it works, uh, maybe why it works. Um, and uh, so let's, uh, let's move along from there, except for the fact that, oh, here we go, okay. Um, infant hydrocephalus is an enormous uh, uh, problem globally. There are probably about a half a million new infant cases of hydrocephalus every year globally. Uh, and we estimate that close to 200,000 uh, of those cases per year occur in sub-Saharan Africa. And the majority of infant hydrocephalus occurs in low and middle income countries where shunts are harder to maintain. So this changes the playing field a, a bit, if you will, in terms of trying to maintain shunt function um, uh, in children under those circumstances. As, as some of you may know, I spent uh, a number of years living and working in Uganda where we helped start this uh, hospital that you see there, Cure Children's Hospital of Uganda. And uh, that little hospital currently uh, treats about 800 new infant cases of hydrocephalus per year. Um, that gives us a big advantage in, in being able to learn some things from, uh, fr from that, that, that kind of, uh, of patient volume, obviously. Um, just to quickly point out that one of the reasons hydrocephalus uh, is probably so common in low and middle income countries is because of post-ventriculitis uh, hydrocephalus. We had found fairly early on in our experience there in our first thousand uh, patients uh, that 60% uh, of the babies that we saw clearly had suffered from post-infectious hydrocephalus resulting from a neonatal infection. Uh, and in fact, we subsequently showed, uh, uh, along with Steve Schiff, a, a longtime colleague of mine, that these infections cycled with the rain uh, fall pattern. Um, and um, Nonetheless, uh, we had all these patients with hydrocephalus uh, coming at us, and uh, uh, for many decades now, the standard treatment of infant hydrocephalus has been placement of a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, which um, in developed countries has uh, become a, an expensive uh, proposition. There is a uh, non-trivial uh, infection rate uh, with shunt implantation. We virtually expect that these implants are going to fail um, at some point, and of course the average is they will fail more than once, and some children suffer uh, dozens or scores of uh, shunt complications over the years. And as children become older and they are shunt dependent, uh, shunt malfunction is a, is a life-threatening emergency. So um, in the context of where we were working at the time, shunt dependence was uh, was more dangerous uh, than managing children with shunts in North America. <clears throat> we we had the opportunity to start uh, looking at using uh, ETV uh, by itself uh, when uh, uh, actually uh, the Norwegian government and the International Federation for Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus sent us a flexible endoscope. It was a Carl Storch 3.7 millimeter flexible 
steerable ventricular scope. At the time, uh, this is back in 2000, uh, I had actually never done an ETV. Uh, it hadn't been part of my training. Uh, uh, ETV had started to become uh, uh, used by, by more people in the, in the late 1990s. But it seemed to make a lot of sense in the context of, uh, of where we were uh, working. Uh, had I been given another type of scope, uh, the way I do things probably would not have evolved the way that they do. Uh, in this uh, picture here, this is a picture from the operating room in Uganda. Uh, we always uh, position the patient with the head turned laterally just in case we had to place a shunt. So we typically would um, prep and drape the child for a right frontal VP shunt placement uh, in case we had to abort the procedure. That was largely driven by the fact that we didn't have good uh, preoperative imaging. Um, here, uh, it was the, uh, the setup at the time, the scope sort of lying on the field, and uh, just, uh, just a one-man operation, nobody has to hold anything, uh, just uh, manipulating this little 3.7 millimeter scope through the uh, right lateral corner of the anterior fontanelle. But uh, what we found, which Mark has already alluded to, is that for young infants, uh, which were the majority uh, of our of our population, ETV usually failed. Uh, most of our babies were under six months of age, and although in this context it made sense to try to avoid shunt placement and accept a, a reasonably high failure rate, um, it wasn't as good as, as, as one would have liked. It's really too bad uh, because of the failure pattern of ETV versus uh, shunt. Uh, this graph is from uh, the work of uh, Abkul Carney, another longtime uh, colleague. And this just demonstrates the fact that if you're treating hydrocephalus in, in babies, um, most of the treatment failures from ETV are going to occur in what I like to call the safe zone. Uh, most ETV failures work, will occur in the, uh, in the first six months. Late failures are much less common than is the case with, uh, with shunt failure. And so to be able to, uh, um, to do this in infants and uh, screen out the ones, if you will, that are not going to need a shunt um, is, is, is very be beneficial. We really wanted to find a way to make uh, uh, ETV work in more uh, uh, infants. So um, for various reasons, and, and partly looking at the historical literature, we, we decided to start adding uh, choroid plexus cauterization to the uh, ETV procedure in infants. Uh, at the time, I thought it may have something to do uh, with uh, the fact that infants perhaps didn't absorb the fluid as efficiently. Um, I'll get back to that uh, momentarily. But um, these uh, images show this uh, Bugby wire uh, that, that we use to cauterize the plexus. This is the foramen of Monroe. And then working back along the atrium, back to the uh, glomus choroidea, and then we get into the uh, uh, temporal horn, and you see the, the choroid plexus here in relationship uh, with the, the uh, hippocampus, and we're able to cauterize the plexus uh, to its most anterior extent in the te temporal horn uh, most of the time. And what we found was that for infants under a year of age, we were able to increase our overall ETV success rate substantially, whereas in older children, it didn't, it didn't really make any difference. Um, this uh, is the way that I currently have the setup. This is using a, a, a Stortz uh, scope holder that just fits to the table. Um, here's the, uh, the endoscope, which is oriented in this direction with the camera coming off towards the foot, and we just manipulate the scope uh, like this. Um, I wouldn't have developed uh, or thought of developing probably the uh, combined uh, ETV-CPC procedure if I had been sent a rigid scope or if I had been biased by having known anything about what I was doing when I first started. So uh, for this, I can really thank the, uh, the Norwegian government and the uh, International Federation for Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus for not asking me what I wanted, but just sending me a scope. Um, and uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Carl Stortz because they have been a partner with us in this uh, developing world of Sub-Saharan Africa work for, um, for uh, more than 15 years now. 
um, they uh, they have helped us in many ways in our training and treatment programs, and, and I'll allude to that in a moment. Uh, this picture here is just to uh, po- remind me to point out that the optics are getting better, that uh, this is an image from a digital flexible endoscope, uh, looking at the uh, frame and magnum, the craniocervical junction and the vertebral artery here. Um, these scopes are becoming now uh, uh, available. And uh, I think it's going to really increase our um, our visibility. Um, in looking at the kinds of hydrocephalus that adding CPC uh, to is, is helpful for, um, we first broke it down into three major etiologies of hydrocephalus. As you know, the, the as I already said, the post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus group uh, was a big group. Um, the myelomeningocele population was our second single most common cause of hydrocephalus, and then the other group, the non-post-infectious hydrocephalus uh, group, is a heterogeneous group of different etiologies. The spina bifida children are really the ones that benefited the most from this. Uh, these infants had about a 35% success rate when we were doing ETB by itself, and our success rate doubled to 75% when we added CPC. The post-infectious hydrocephalus group uh, as a total group doesn't fare as well, um, but we later sorted out what Mark has already alluded to, and that is that some of these children have cisternal scarring because they've had a meningitic component to their uh, infection, and some of them have clean basal cisterns, and the infection has been limited to a ventriculitis. Those children have uh, a much better uh, success rate for endoscopic uh, treatment. And in fact, it's become our uh, treatment model, uh, uh, both in Uganda and here as well, for the post-hemorrhagic uh, infants, which are quite similar pathophysiologically. But if the prepontine cistern is badly scarred, we, we go ahead and place a shunt because the failure rate is, is sufficiently high. Um, and looking at this middle group uh, with different etiologies of hydrocephalus, we found that when we added uh, choroid plexus cauterization, it really increased our success rate for babies with um, um, aqueduct stenosis, even those that had no apparent reason for hydrocephalus, congenital idiopathic, uh, quote, communicating hydrocephalus of infancy. We were able to achieve uh, a fair level of success where ETV by itself nearly always failed. Um, Dandy Walker, encephalocele. One question that I think is not uh, is not clearly understood is why is ETB less successful in little babies, uh, and why would choroid plexus cauterization increase the success rate? Um, a couple of different models of thinking about hydrocephalus give us a couple of different ways of thinking about this. In the classic so-called bulk flow model where uh, hydro, uh, CSF is made in the ventricles and it uh, flows out of the ventricular system into the uh, subarachnoid spaces where it gets absorbed in the arachnoid granulations. Um, one might think infants have a reduced uh, ability to absorb CSF. We know that in very young uh, humans, the arachnoid granulations are not uh, fully developed. And that, and that might play a role. So um, in that model, ETV would work by bypassing an obstruction, like a fourth ventricle outlet obstruction or aqueduct stenosis, whereas uh, CPC might reduce the CSF production to a degree that um, it levels the playing field a little bit for infants who might be left otherwise with a communicating sort of hydrocephalus from absorption problems. The other model of thinking about hydrocephalus that uh, that that other people have uh, uh, have written about is the hydrodynamic model. Various uh, variations on this model, but in that model, hydrocephalus is more a problem of disordered pulsations uh, intracranially as the systolic pulse wave comes into the intracranial compartment, and and uh, ETV in that model may, at least in part, act by uh, creating an, um, a pulsation absorber, which allows the, pulsa- the intraventricular pulsations to escape uh, through the floor of the third ventricle and avoid the uh, high amplitude pulsations, which may be necessary to cause a progressive expansion 
uh, in the ventricles. Babies have more compliant brains, and adding a pulsation absorber may not be in itself sufficient in younger children. And so with adding CPC, there's some indication that this may actually reduce the pulsation driver because chorae plexus contributes to the intraventricular pulsations, and there may be an additive effect in that way. Um, but I don't know. Um, however it works, uh, we found uh, in Uganda that um, really shunt dependence could usually be avoided. And about two out of three babies, we were able to uh, treat their hydrocephalus uh, successfully without having to create shunt uh, dependence. Because of these uh, large volumes of patients, we've been able to answer uh, a number of questions uh, along the way. We first, of course, were concerned uh, to look at the safety of ETV CPC. And uh, we found that even in the circumstances of working in Uganda, our operative infection rate was less than 1%, certainly better than our shunt uh, infection rate, which was more along the lines of 8 or 9%. And uh, the uh, operative mortality, defined as any death within a month of surgery, including malaria or any other cause, uh, was again less than 1%. So it was, a, it was a safe operation. And then since we were starting to treat all babies uh, up front endoscopically, we wanted to ask the question whether upfront endoscopic treatment, whether it was an abandoned ETV with placement of a shunt at the same sitting, or whether it was placement of a shunt after an ETV CPC had failed, whether that compromised the future longevity of the shunt in these children by increasing the infection rate or an increase in the uh, uh, material floating in the, in the ventricles. And what we found was that there was no compromise at all. Um, in fact, um, the groups uh, that had uh, 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 been implanted with a ventricular peritoneal shunt after failed ETV CPC or those uh, in whom the shunt was implanted at the time that uh, the endoscopic procedure was abandoned did not have a higher failure or infection rate than those who had been treated primarily with a uh, shunt uh, with no endoscope uh, involved. So that was, that was reassuring. Um, and then, as Mark has already uh, talked about, uh, is reopening a closed ETV an effective, uh, an effective thing to do? Well, uh, the answer is yes, and I agree completely that uh, the answer is also tempered by the time course of the failure. So when we looked at this in a, in a group of 215 infants who had undergone reopening of an ETV, um, we found that overall we had about a 50% success rate uh, long term. But when we broke that down to the timing of failure, what we found was that the later the failure, the more likely it was to work, which makes, makes complete sense. But there was one question that was uh, troublesome, um, and that was, are we trading uh, anything there for these children in regard to their brain development? Uh, for the perceived uh, benefits of not being shunt dependent for the rest of their life. And the reason that was a concern was because uh, it's widely recognized and has been for a long time that shunts simply give you smaller ventricles. Um, if, you, if you look at a child who's been treated uh, with ETB uh, and they've had very large ventricles, you don't really expect those ventricles to come down to normal, whereas with a shunt, they... they may come down to normal or even less than normal size. So was, the, was it possible that uh, shunts might be better uh, than ETV with or without CPC for early brain development? We had some uh, retrospective uh, uh, data from the spina bifida population that was encouraging. We looked uh, retrospectively at uh, three groups of our spina bifida population, uh, the ones uh, that had not required treatment for hydrocephalus, which, by the way, was uh, uh, about 30%. So about a third of these children, if you're a little um, patient, don't require anything for their hydrocephalus. Those who had been implanted with a shunt and those who had been treated by ETV CPC. And each of these boxes here is a, is a subfield of the uh, Bailey Scales of Infant Development. And there was no statistically significant difference between the um, 
the age normed uh, scores of the shunted group versus those of the ETV CPC group. Kids that had no hydrocephalus um, uh, overall uh, did better than kids who did have hydrocephalus, um, but as you can see, the shunted group didn't do any better uh, than the ETV CPC group. It looks like the shunted group uh, didn't do as well, uh, but that uh, wasn't statistically significant except in the, the case of one of the one of the subfields. We needed, though, to have uh, more definitive um, uh, guidance on this, more assurance that we weren't in any way compromising brain development. And uh, we uh, were afforded this opportunity when we uh, uh, got the support of uh, NIH funding over the last few years. Um, and have been carrying out this trial, Neurocognitive Outcomes and Changes in Brain and CSF Volume After Treatment of Post-Infectious Hydrocephalus in Ugandan Infants uh, by Shunting versus ETV-CPC. The reason we chose uh, the post-infectious group uh, to study was partly because they were our single biggest population, and so it was the most pressing uh, issue, and also because the post-infectious group uh, were uh, as a whole, the least um, uh, successful group and the most likely to wind up with a shunt um, uh, anyway. So we were taking children under six months of age, which was uh, put them in the lowest uh, success score in our Ugandan scoring system, and those with post-infectious hydrocephalus, and we randomized those uh, to ETV versus ETV-CPC. Um, in that study, these were children less than six months of age. They had to meet our rather rigid algorithm for defining post-infectious hydrocephalus. The mom had to be old enough to understand and consent. And we only studied patients in districts that were um, in the general region of our hospital because we didn't want to put a shunt in a baby and send them up to South Sudan. That wouldn't, that wouldn't make sense. They'd be harder to study and they'd have uh, more difficulty getting back to us uh, in the case of shunt malfunction. The primary outcome measure was the um, uh, Bailey Scales of Infant Development cognitive score. Secondary outcome measures were uh, the other subscores as well as looking at actual brain and CSF volumes measured off of CT scan, uh, and then morbidity, mortality, and treatment failure. There were some crossovers because of what we had learned from uh, our experience in prepontine cistern scarring and how that uh, has an effect on outcome. So um, this is what a prepontine cistern should look like, and it often does in children with post-infectious hydrocephalus uh, if it has just been confined to ventriculitis. But if we uh, looked in and saw a prepontine cistern that was badly scarred like this, and this is the same view, the basilar artery is encased in scar tissue here, then we would proceed to primary shunt placement, uh, and, and, and they, that would be a crossover in the group. And then the patients had to be a candidate for either procedure. For instance, this child here needs uh, <laughs> some of what uh, we saw in, in, in the earlier talk with multi-compartment hydrocephalus. You can't just uh, optimally treat this child by putting in a shunt or by uh, doing an ETV. This child really needs uh, combined uh, approach because an ETV might not even be anatomically possible, but you can't place a shunt uh, adequately and have it drain all the compartments. So they had to be a good candidate for either upfront procedure. Um, our one-year results were uh, just published about three or four weeks ago in the New England Journal, and this is 100 uh, patients after uh, uh, screening 158. 51 were randomized to ETV-CPC, 49 were randomized uh, to shunt, and then there were nine crossovers because of that scarred cistern uh, that I was talking about. So these children just went on to, uh, to have a shunt. There were no patients lost to follow-up. And just to summarize this very quickly, because, I, because it was important to me to know this, there was no difference in the primary outcome measure between the two treatments. And this is either uh, intention to treat or as treated in regard to the primary outcome measure of cognitive score. Neither was there any difference in any of the other Bailey Scales subscores of neurocognitive uh, assessment. There was no difference in brain volume. So these children, and these are brain volume curves here, 
it didn't matter whether they had been treated by a shunt or by ETV CPC, their brain volume and their brain growth after treatment uh, was the same. There was no statistically significant difference. And that was in spite of the fact that the ventricles in the shunted patients were significantly smaller uh, as expected. And uh, there was no significant difference in treatment failure or mortality uh, between, uh, uh, between the two groups. We've subsequently, uh, and these are unpublished data uh, yet, so I'll just mention them in passing. We've looked at a, uh, we've done a post hoc analysis of cost uh, effectiveness of the two treatments in this 100 patient cohort, and we have uh, we have found that uh, ETV CPC is a more effective intervention in terms of uh, avoiding disability adjusted life years, and we've also found that in a very detailed cost analysis as um, uh, I think it was I think it was Mark who uh, mentioned this already um, that uh, this was actually less costly than than placing a shunt and therefore uh, it was uh, it, it looked to be a more cost effective form of upfront treatment and then we've looked at post operative seizure rates and found no difference at all uh, over a two year uh, follow up. In North America, uh, uh, I'll just uh, just one slide on the Boston experience here, and that is that since we started uh, using ETV CPC as the primary treatment for infant hydrocephalus, which was long about 2009 2010 when I came, um, our uh, shunt placement numbers have gone down for children less than a year of age to about. Uh, about a, a half or a third of what they used to be, which is about what you would expect. And um, in this uh, paper where we did a first look at our, at our experience here, in 100 consecutive infants treated in this way, uh, 91 of them were treated, I'm sorry, 100 consecutive infants presenting for treatment with hydrocephalus, 91 of them we treated endoscopically, another Nine were shunted up front for various reasons, including seeing prepontine scarring on the sagittal CISS MRI imaging, uh, as has already been uh, described. 57% of those required no further surgery, and by doing uh, appro at appropriate uh, times uh, reopening of closed ETV, 65% have remained shunt free. So, overall, using this paradigm, we've been able to. Uh, uh, avoid shunt placement in 59 of this 100 uh, infant uh, uh, cohort, which is substantially uh, uh, fewer shunts than would have been the case uh, a few years ago, where most of these kids really would have uh, would have been shunted. Um, we've had the opportunity to uh, 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 and the fun, frankly, of uh, taking numbers of uh, colleagues across uh, North America to Uganda, which. Uh, uh, which is helpful because of the high case volume uh, to uh, uh, to show them the technique, to have them uh, uh, learn the technique, both of using flexible endoscopy, which is frankly a different skill set than using rigid endoscope, and uh, to do the uh, the CPC procedure. So, uh, in summary, uh, and at the very end here, if I'm able to, I'm going to try to show a brief video clip of uh, of, of some of the. A choroid plexus cauterization just to show what it looks like. Um, from what we've learned from our studies, especially in post-infectious hydrocephalus, babies less than six months of age, we found uh, um, the same one-year failure rate. Uh, and in fact, now that we've followed these out to, to two years now, we're seeing shunt failures and no further ETV CPC failures. Our latest endoscopic failure was uh, at eight months, none since then, uh, whereas shunts have continued to fail and have now exceeded uh, the endoscopic failures that just passed two years, and that's to be expected. Um, we have uh, at one year the same cognitive outcome, uh, the same uh, brain growth despite the difference in ventricles, uh, the same one-year survival, the same one-year success rate, the same risk of post-operative seizure development. Um, shunts have a higher infection risk. The only infections we had uh, in the 100-patient uh, randomized trial were in four patients who had a shunt implanted. Um, and, of course, shunted patients remain at risk beyond the safe zone, 
uh, when nearly all the endoscopic failures occur. Now, as we go forward following these children, the ones that have shunts are going to be shunt dependent and uh, shunt malfunctions are going to become uh, more of an issue. Whereas in early infancy, treatment failure is a visible diagnosis to the mother and it's not such an emergency. So the head starts to grow, the fontanelle starts to bulge, they have time to um, to get back to the hospital, whereas uh, in older children, the symptoms can come on more uh, acutely and it can be confused with other things. And uh, finally, we, we think that uh, endoscopic treatment is likely more cost effective, certainly in um, low and middle income, low resource environments, but um, more than likely in other environments as well, although we haven't had a chance to study that. So all of this suggests that a primary treatment of infant hydrocephalus by ETV CPC may be the better protocol in limited research environment uh, resource environments, uh, if appropriate training and resources are in place, and that's an important point. Obviously, uh, we've been able to uh, begin addressing this over uh, over the years through uh, what we call our Cure Hydrocephalus um, uh, uh, Training and Treatment Program. This has uh, been a, a funded three month fellowship at Cure Children's Hospital of Uganda. Um, if the um, if the fellow who is a neurosurgeon from uh, a developing country um, uh, demonstrates uh, competence and safety in the procedure, we provide them with the equipment. Um, over time, we provide maintenance and replacement of the equipment. Uh, shunts are provided by the International Federation for Spina Bifida Hydrocephalus, and we use the Chabra shunt made in India. It costs about $40, and it works um, in several Three studies that we've done now have shown that it uh, it works about as well as an expensive shunt uh, that we use here in, in Boston. Um, we hire a local uh, uh, clinical coordinator because patient follow-up is so important, especially in that first six-month window, that we don't want to lose any patients to follow up. And we uh, have started now a multi-center clinical uh, database. Since 2001, if you include Uganda, we've uh, uh, treated more than 20,000 uh, children for hydrocephalus. We've trained 30 surgeons in 19 countries, and in 2015, we um, that single year, we treated about 3,000 children. Um, if anyone is interested in this uh, in this program, uh, they can go to cure.org/hydrocephalus and get uh, and get more uh, information. I have a number of people I'd like to uh, thank um, uh, over the years for. Uh, for this work, uh, not the least of which are my colleagues in Uganda uh, who are, have been doing all the work now for the last uh, uh, really 10 years. Um, uh, my family, donors, Cure International, numerous co-investigators um, couldn't have done uh, any of this without uh, people, uh, smart people uh, to do things that I'm not able to do. Uh, of course, NIH, and the Fogarty Institute, the the uh, United States, uh, the USAID, uh, for uh, especially allowed us to have a CT scan, the MacArthur Foundation, and then again the Carl Stortz uh, company, and uh, in particular Mrs. Stortz, um, they have uh, continued to partner with us and uh, allow us to obtain the endoscopy equipment that we provide uh, for for our trainees uh, at a reduced cost. And uh, and that's huge because uh, we probably couldn't uh, afford to do this without without that kind of support. Um, at the very end here, what I would like to do is just to show uh, a couple of very brief video clips. Um, this is after the ETV is done. Uh, here's the frame of Monroe. Um, and um, this is the, the Bugby wire cone coming in to cauterize the, the choroid yeah, plexus. Here. I'm going to speed it up here. Uh, the this uh, is uh, now anterior is to the left, which is different orientation than what uh, you may be used to seeing because the patient's head is turned to the side, uh, as I described uh, previously. We're coming on back here, we're going to start seeing the um, superior choroidal vein, and we'll start to see this membrane, this telochoroidea-like membrane that tethers the glomus choroidea down here. We try to get uh, uh, all of this uh, as, much as, uh, as much as possible. We do have some evidence that the extent 
of plexus cauterization uh, does affect uh, uh, outcome. And I'll stay in touch with you. I heard Monday, last I heard. There's the glomus choroidea. We'll keep checking over the week. Starting to work on that. Okay. And uh, it's it, it takes a little time. It takes it takes me about fifteen or twenty minutes per ventricle. So we do this first uh, in the right lateral ventricle, uh, and then we, if need be, we do a septostomy and come across into the left lateral ventricle to do the same thing on the other side. I'm just going to switch to uh, a different clip here, which uh, shows uh, getting around into the uh, temporal horn. So this is after having cauterized things here in the atrium. We're going to turn the scope, uh, we're going to twist it clockwise and flex the tip, and this gets us right into the temporal horn. Uh, here's the chorae plexus of the temporal horn, and uh, we'll start to cauterize that there. And you can see that's the anterior extent of the plexus there. I I've not tried it. I, I don't think that you can do this uh, with a rigid scope, especially bilaterally from uh, a single right frontal uh, uh, entry point. Um, and so that's that's why I uh, I advocate for doing this with a uh, with a rigid I mean with a flexible scope. So with that, I will uh, conclude uh, uh, my remarks and um, uh, turn it over to uh, questions. Dr. Worf, thank you. If you can uh, disengage from the, uh, the your, your laptop, that'd be terrific. I'm uh, oh, trying I'm to start. do that now. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to start by saying that in our, in our field of neurosurgery, seldom does one have a, a potential for affecting the, the care on a global level, and you've done just that. And I, I, I watch this work with such great admiration, and I can't thank you enough for your contributions. I mean, you've really uh, defined a, a, an entirely new playing field. Um, one of the questions that came up from uh, our, our viewers was, at the time of repeat uh, ETV or CPC, can you make any comments about the observation you've seen of the choroid plexus? Does it seem to uh, form this recrudescence of viable choroid plexus, or does it uh, look as if it's scarred at the time of re-exploration, and how do you handle it? Um. Am I, am I still there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. I I don't I don't see myself there anymore. So I was I was a little I was a little worried. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great that's a great question. Um, and uh, absolutely, I've uh, I've re endoscoped uh, many children that have had choroid plexus cauterization, uh, and was initially curious to see whether it would regenerate or grow back. And in fact, what happens is the plexus that's been blanched and shriveled at the time of the uh, original operation has uh, further reduced and gone away to form basically a thin uh, line of scar along the, along the choroidal fissure there. Occasionally you'll see some little uh, uh, branches of, uh, of plexus that, that didn't get taken out the first time around, but I don't, I don't think that it regenerates. Okay, thank you. Um, you. You made a mention of a, uh, I'll use the, the oncologic phrase, of a dose response issue with regard to the amount of choroid plexus that you uh, coagulate. I can pretty much expect your answer, but can you tell us what that threshold is? <laughs> well, um, this is something Ab Kolkarni helped me look at quite a number of years ago uh, because he, he he does statistics and I, and I don't. <laughs> so he's been a huge help to me. And what we found was that uh, there was basically a dose, a dose response curve um, it, that was pretty crude in that we had no volumetric uh, measure of how much plexus had been, uh, had been uh, uh, cauterized. It was basically uh, 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 unilateral, uh, bilateral, uh, partial, and complete. That's kind of the way we, we, we looked at it. For me, uh, a, a, a thorough plexus cauterization involves what I just demonstrated, which is to get all the plexus, beginning at the frame of Monroe, going back to the atrium, thoroughly uh, doing the, uh, uh, the glomus and its tethering membrane, and then coming around the corner to look into the temporal horn and, and, and get that plexus. I think if you can't get all of it, it's still worthwhile, but uh, in theory, I think it's better to do uh, to do as much as you can access. I imagine you're pretty talented in video games. 
<laughs> Actually, I, I don't play video games, so I, I don't know. I didn't think so. <laughs> you didn't know that at all. <laughs> uh, one of the questions that came up during uh, your talk, and if you want to field it, feel free, and that was in the management of a supracellular arachnoid cysts or prepontine arachnoid cysts. Um, the relative uh, need for doing a superior ventriculo cystostomy versus a cysto uh, cisternotomy at the basal aspect of these cysts. Do you care to comment on that? I can comment, but probably not as eloquently as you. I mean, I've done quite a number of those. I uh, and and I'll just say I do both. So I I uh, I come through the dome of the cyst. Uh, I make as big a fenestration as I can, and I go down below and get the bottom end of the cyst to vent that into the prepontine cistern, mm -hmm. and then. Up at the top of the dome, I use uh, cautery and uh, and shrivel it down to uh, to a nubbin. So I haven't tried doing it without fenestrating it into the prepontine cistern. I, I always do both. I suspect yeah. you do too. I, I do. Your, your yeah. suspicion is correct. Uh, there, there's been an attempt in the published literature to look at this in a meta-analysis, and, and it pretty much supports the contention that the the basal membrane should probably, if safe, uh, fenestrate it as well. I, I find that very apical membrane to be extremely redundant once it's fenestrated and very right. floppy and probably has a greater likelihood of rescarring re in again. So I, I, I utilize both, as you indicated. Yeah. But the cautionary note there is that that, that basal membrane can be mid basal or below and it takes uh, absolutely white. absolutely and i've never tried that with a rigid scope i have i've used rigid scope actually fairly infrequently uh yeah. with and i'm very comfortable with the flexible using that tip as sort of uh, using the wire through the working channel coming out just beyond the tip of the flexible scope i think of it like a micro like a micro instrument yeah. And with uh, with torquing uh, the scope with my right hand and uh, using the the tip flexor with my left hand, and my left third finger, and using the uh, instrument between my thumb and index finger, you can have a lot of degrees of freedom and make very tiny movements. And so um, it's it's almost like doing it under a microscope uh, with a micro dissector. And I'm I've gotten comfortable doing that, but it's pretty high real estate. Yeah, yeah. Well, well. Again, thanks for that contribution. Any other questions that we had for uh, no, Doctor Work? Thanks again for joining us, Doctor Work. My pleasure. It. Thanks for the invitation. Wonderful talk. Are we